thank you everybody for joining uh, us here at Titan Cloud today uh, for this um, first of a three-part webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about advances in alarm management, uh, cutting through the noise. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the first session of a three-part series all about how you can leverage technology to improve maintenance efficiency at your facilities. Looks like we have a pretty good turnout today, so thank you everybody for taking some time out of your busy schedule to spend some time with us. So without further ado, um, I'll just introduce myself. My name is John Kelly. I'm the Vice President of Alliances and Business Development here at Titan Cloud. Uh, I was um, running Canary Compliance, which was acquired by Titan Cloud Software a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Brent Puzak, and I'll let Brent introduce himself. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Brent Puzak, like John said, I'm VP of Solutions Consulting at uh, Titan Cloud. I've got a little over uh, 25 years in the industry. I've done a lot of work on the regulatory side, consulting side, and then the bulk of my career was on the retail side, where I've kind of managed compliance for some large retailers uh, across the across the country. So certainly look forward to sharing you sharing insights with you today as we kind of move forward. Excellent. Thank you, Brent. Uh, looking forward to talking with you today. So um, Brent's actually going to kick things off here. And as he mentioned, he has a wealth of experience um, in the real world. And he's going to share some um, useful history and, and some context on the landscape with respect to equipment and compliance. So Brent, over to you. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, in, in the context of what we're talking about today is really uh, you know, the uh, noise that are actually is created by the alarm conditions that are, are occurring out at the locations. And this could be you know, alarm conditions from sensors and in, in containments, tanks, it could be any IoT device that are generating, you know, exception reports that come in. So, you know, the 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 context of what we're looking at is when you think about this from a regulatory side, you know, over the years you were seeing more and more double wall systems that are that are being installed at locations. A lot of this is driven by certainly regulations and you know, a number of years ago, you might have saw you know, the average uh, exception that you're managing, maybe uh, two or three locate uh, two or three exceptions per per tank. Um, Today, we're seeing locations that have you know, up to 50 plus uh, sensors that are generating exceptions from testing and other, other conditions. So the volume that teams are having to manage, not just on the environmental side, but the fuel side and other parts of the space maintenance and, and uh, is, is, pretty, is pretty significant. And as double wall systems continue to be rolled out, we're going to see those alarm conditions and those, those exceptions continue to kind of increase year over year. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, the context of what we're really talking about is, is certainly, you know, you're, you know, over the in the coming years, you're going to see, you know, potentially more alarm conditions, more exceptions that are occurring. You know, you're seeing out there more testing requirements. You're seeing more inspection requirements. You're going to talk about AFIs and the inspections. In the upcoming sessions, so you know the the volume that you're handling and the noise that are created from these uh, from these events are really things that uh, may be preventing your teams from getting to kind of the root causes or, or issues that might be causing new releases or issues at your locations. So the, you know some of the research I saw is um, you know that it, over the since 2018, you know we've seen a 10% uh, decrease in compliance rates relative to release detection requirements across across the EPA's analysis. So, you know, there there's more focus on the regulatory side, you know, as they as they get their feet under them on these new regulations to really help kind of drive uh, more operational compliance across across organizations. So, you know, just contextually when, as we talk through this, you know, you're going to be seeing more more and more uh, alarm conditions, more and more impacts relative to the new systems that are going into the into the ground. So, what you're seeing is you know, fewer tanks may be getting installed than we're getting installed in the in the late 80s and in the 90s. However, the number of sensors per tank is increasing because we're mo seeing this shift to double walled equipment, where there is that interstitial sensor in the lining that's designed to detect the presence of liquid. And so it's another thing you have to test. It's another thing that could have a wiring problem. It's another thing that could detect the presence of liquid. And those are all you know, good things that you're detecting these issues, but it, it's more and more stuff that you have to worry about. And if you're getting false positives or anything like that, that's indicating that something may be going on, it can really cloud, uh, crowd the um, your inbox if you're getting notified about all of these things. So I think it's an interesting trend that we're seeing this uh, this rise in testing and monitoring and, and you know, potential 
um, for notifications about issues. Absolutely, and just for some context, our analysis was, a, was we, we analyzed uh, about uh, a little over 10,000 facilities kind of across, across clients, across client data, um, and a little over 30,000 tank systems uh, for the alarm conditions that we're, we're showing here and the tank systems that we're showing here. Great. Yeah. Well, we can keep moving here. So yeah, sorry to interrupt, no, but keep going. Perfect. Yeah, and then when you're thinking about the the, the total volume of alarms, so out of those you know ten thousand uh, over ten thousand locations, we saw that that we we were that those sites were generating almost fourteen million alarm conditions, kind of across those across those clients. And if you look back from two thousand twenty to present, that that volume of alarms has continued to increase client, you know, uh, across, you know, really all of our clients. So what we've seen is like when, when companies kind of get on board with solutions, they, they, you know, they kind of set it and forget it. And we're going to talk a little bit about how do we help you kind of relook at those in just, in just a bit, uh, different ways to help you kind of minimize that overall impact on your, on your teams. Um, and a lot of that is really, you know, really understanding the, the alarms that are occurring at your locations understanding ways that you can actually improve and, and uh, minimize those alarm conditions. It's about also standardizing those, those alarm conditions across your site. So, you know, our analysis, when we looked at it, there's, there's probably, you know, a thousand different ways companies are naming, you know, different types of unleaded sensors and just the different products. So standardizing the data that you're getting from these systems so that you can actually run some very, you know, good actionable analytics from the from the platforms that you're that you're utilizing, um, and then it's it's also the you know optimizing that. So it's it's taking all of those all of those data points, and again, we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail as we move through. But leveraging that the data that you're collecting to actually working on uh, actually work on ways to minimize that that total number of alarms that are actually uh, occurring from the system. So. What you want to be able to see is that that those alarms over time actually reducing, um, and then you you you're providing really good actionable data to the individuals that are actually responsible for managing this. And a, a good point is that you know the data that we're analyzing here is not just on the environmental side, which we'll talk a lot about on the environmental, but it's also overlays on the fuel side. It's also overlaying on the maintenance side of items. So what we're wanting to try to do. With the data and the processes we're showing you is how do we minimize that impacts on your teams how do we minimize kind of duplicate dispatches that may be happening to your to through your maintenance systems uh, maintenance systems and actually reducing costs and efforts uh, you know kind of cross functionally across across your organizations as you're managing these types of conditions so i'm gonna john if you got other input yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think this all kind of, you know, builds on, you know, you, you observe the trend of the double walled equipment getting installed. And we're seeing here just in the last few years, the, the volume of alarms across, you know, a large base of locations and customers continuing to, go, to increase, which is supporting all of what you were saying about, around the number of sensors increases, the number of alarms is going to increase. And this 14 million over three and a half years is kind of a head spinning. Um, number and 100,000 sensors. One thing that, uh, that the audience will see is there's a poll question up right now, and we're going to actually look at a case study that we did that hopefully you know brings this into a little bit more real world context because 14 million alarms is is kind of impossible to even wrap your head around. Um, but we actually did a study of a 700 site chain over two months, so 60 days, 700 sites, and we tracked how many alarms. Um, when were, were active and cleared during that two month period. Now this includes all kinds of alarms, whether it's paper jams, whether it's blow product, um, a tank overfill alarm, a PLLV shutdown alarm, whatever it might be. So um, we'll, we'll leave that poll open for another few seconds here. We've got about 20 answers. So if you haven't responded yet, give it your best guess and, and um, we'll show you uh, what we learned um, kind of moving forward here as we look at this case study. We'll just give it a couple more seconds here. All right, so most people are thinking it's in the 15,000 range with uh, with a few also looking at the 6,000 range. Now, it might surprise you all to see that it was actually the 30,000 number um, that was the closest uh, to what we, uh, what we observed over 700 sites in two months. And this to us was a, a really crazy finding. It seemed like a huge, number of alarms that are activating and clearing over a very short period. And so we really decided to dive into this and figure out what was going on 
And uh, what we said was, okay, well, first of all, if we're looking at this from a purely environmental standpoint, we probably don't need to be considering low product alarms um, and kind of, you know, paper jams and stuff like that, or paper out alarms and stuff like that. So let's just strip those out and only look at compliance related alarms. So here we're talking CSLD, interstitial sensors, um, PLLD, stuff like that. And there were still 17,000 compliance related alarms, which may or may not require some kind of, um, you know, action to be taken depending on the context. Now, what we decided to do from there was to look at what we saw in those 17,000 alarms and say, okay, is this really 17,000 alarms that someone would need to actually respond to or, or is there something else going on? And what we actually uncovered was that if you look at the root cause of what's triggering these alarms to go off, there are only about 2,000 actual issues. And a good example of, an, of a way that a, uh, this volume of alarms can actually get abbreviated um, quite significantly is, is a wiring problem with a sensor or with a probe or something like that. Many of you who operate facilities will probably know that if you have a wiring problem with your sensor, it's going to go in and out of alarm constantly, you know, potentially every minute or two until the wiring issue gets addressed. And so you can suddenly have hundreds, if not thousands of alarms occurring at one facility with one piece of equipment that would aggregate into this really high number. And so when you think about that, it's like, okay, there's only actually one problem going on. We have a wiring issue, but I'm being notified every single time, you know, by my tank monitoring system that this, you know, thing has not been addressed. And so, you know, we've realized that understanding the context of what's going on with these alarms is super important because if you do have a situation where your L1 sensor at one site is going haywire and you're getting notified every single time about this, you may lose the fact that if another L1 sensor from a different site is also uh, is actually going into alarm whether the presence of fuel detected in an interstitial space you might just lose it within this sea of alarms that are coming through so very important to understand what's really going on and if possible um, you know standardize the the response to those so you can actually understand what's happening at the root cause and aren't getting flooded with unnecessary alerts now, the other thing is that there are things that can get addressed remotely, and there are some things that need field service. And when we looked at um, how these issues were actually handled, only 350 of them actually required a site visit. Many of them were things that could get addressed remotely um, with a, a remote interface of the tank monitor um, to address the, the, the problem. So the, the point of all of this is that you know, 30,000 alarms, 350 things that actually need to get done, um, you're looking really for a needle in a haystack unless you have some kind of mechanism for filtering through the noise. If you're only using a simple filtering mechanism to say, don't show me low product because all I care about is environmental, you might still have a huge volume of alarms that you need to weed through in order to find out what's going on. And so, you know, what we encourage um, is for people to leverage whatever they can to um to, to make sense of this overwhelming volume of noise. Um, and, you know, we've, you know, we're, we can certainly talk about the technology solutions uh, that are out there. Um, and with everyone here on the call being a Titan customer, um, you know, certainly we've got some stuff at the end here to encourage you to explore how else we can help you um, wade through this sea of, of information a little bit more easily. So I'm going to keep moving here. And um, one of the areas also where we saw a massive um, opportunity for people to reduce the volume of alarms that are occurring in the first place. And Brent touched on this a little bit earlier, has to do with the configuration of the tank monitor itself. A tank monitor is essentially an alarm system. And if the alarm thresholds are set incorrectly, you may be either finding out too late that something is a problem or not finding out at all if something is a problem, depending on how the tank monitor settings have been configured. There was an instance where we also spoke to a customer who um, before they were a customer, told us they had a, um, an organization-wide process where um, they refused to accept a delivery at any facility where there was more than an inch of water in the tank. And we said, that's a great policy, you know, very, very sound. How do you actually know that you have an inch of water in your tank? And they said, well, all of our tank monitors are programmed to send us an alarm when uh, it gets above one inch. And we said, also very good. Then a few weeks later, we heard from them and they said, actually, um, you know, we just had a problem at one of our facilities where um, a tank took on water. We didn't get notified. Six cars broke down on the lot from the contaminated fuel and we had to address the problem. Uh, it cost us a lot of money, really bad PR for us, you know, so on and so forth. And we said, well, what happened here? I thought you had this system. And they said, well, actually, 
we looked at that particular facility and um, the, the tank monitor was supposed to be set to notify us at one inch, but someone had actually programmed it at 10 inches as opposed to 1.0 inches. And uh, so they didn't get notified about the issue um, until there was already a problem on their hands. We, want, we then got them as a customer and we said, okay, well, it sounds like the settings of your uh, facilities may not be what you think. Let's audit them and look across the board at what your configurations are so this doesn't happen again. And what it turned out was that the customer thought they had their, their tank high water limit set at 1.0 inches and their high water warning inch um, warning at uh, 1.5 inches. And not a single facility had the high water limit at 1.0 inches and 9% of the facilities across about 50, 60 sites, I think it was, um, had the correct settings for their high water warnings. And this was really alarming to them, if you'll pardon the pun, um, because they thought that they were taken care of based on the way that their tank monitors had been configured. However, over the years, maybe it was a technician, maybe it was a dealer, maybe something happened where the feeder route um, lost power and then came back and power cycled and they didn't get it reprogrammed uh, properly, whatever it might be that had happened, uh, their settings were not what they expected. And this, as I mentioned before, can lead to either you getting notified far too often or notified far too infrequently um, about particular issues. Um, and uh, and that's a huge risk for your business. And so we'll, we'll put another poll out here um, for the group just to, to kind of noodle on um, with all of uh, what we're talking about here, because this is a little bit scary when, when, um, when you think about all the facilities that you have out there and you know not potentially knowing whether your configuration is what you're expecting or not. Um, I think it's something that, uh, that people don't necessarily think about in the context of alarm management, but it can make a big difference if those settings are, uh, are correct or incorrect. So we'll leave that one there for, for a few more minutes for, for people to, um, to think about and respond to. But in our final um, case study here, where we looked at another customer, what we saw was that a lot of times when it comes to alarm management, people depend on people within their organization to respond to it and are not necessarily getting to the root cause of issues with any kind of systematic and um, standardized methodology. We had a customer who had an environmental analyst who was you know, quite good at their job, um, but was relatively new to the industry uh, and had been given uh, a spreadsheet that had been handed down through the organization over the years that um, indicated what a hot alarm was. And a hot alarm was something that was considered high risk and required a dispatch based on the perspective of whoever it was that originally put this list together. And so whenever this analyst would receive a notification that there was some kind of alarm, whether it was a PLLD shutdown, um, you know, a sensor alarm, whatever it might be, there were certain things that met criteria that um, meant they should be dispatched for, they just sent out a third party technician to go and take care of it. Now, this was costing them an awful lot of money because they didn't have internal maintenance and they were relying on third parties. And um, what often happens with, um, with alarms is that the name of the alarm may indicate that it's high risk. However, the broader context of what's happening with the alarm may give you a clue as to whether or not it's really high risk or not. One very good example is PLLD shutdown alarms. PLLD shutdown alarms are very high risk if they occur because there's been some kind of leak in the system. However, a PLLD alarm can also occur in a couple of other instances. It can occur because you do have a catastrophic failure, it can occur because you ran out of fuel, and it can also occur because there's been pressure built up in the line. Now, two of those three situations don't technically require a dispatch. The third one requires an immediate dispatch because you have an environmental issue on your hands. So the question is, you know, if you're just being notified that there's a PLD shutdown alarm and you have no other context around it, how do you know if you need to dispatch or not? And that's what this customer was running into. And so what ended up happening was they leveraged the automated alarm intelligence um, through Titan Cloud, and it was able to help them get to the bottom of the issues much more quickly without having to dispatch a service technician to go and do discovery work or figure out what was going on. And what we saw was a really dramatic drop off in the number of um, facility visits that occurred with that customer, even just in the first 60 days, where they were sending out 70 service calls a month over 50 locations, and they got that number down to nine, and then they sustained it in the kind of, you know, high single to low double digit number um, over the course of, of the subsequent, um, you know, period of time. So getting additional context around what's going on, for instance, with a PLD alarm, if you're knowing that not only a PLD alarm is happening, but also a low product alarm happened at the same time for the same tank, maybe you can deduce 
that you don't have an environmental emergency on your hand. Maybe if you've got something that indicates what the pressure readings are, you can see that there's a drop off in pressure and you can rerun a line test before sending somebody out to the facility. These are all ways that technology enables you to be much more efficient with your spend than just by sending someone out to the facility um, to address it. So um, that's you know just some context that we found from real world case studies with customers. And with all of that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Brent to talk about um, you know, other opportunities to cut through the noise. Yeah, let, let's circle back um, on the, those close to 14 million alarm conditions that we were seeing within our existing data set. And like John had mentioned, right, it, it's it's really a, a process. And I want you to kind of think about it in context of, of your internal teams and how your teams are kind of managing the overall volume of alarms that may be occurring at your locations. And also think about it on the on the store level impact. You know, the 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 stores being able to try to to trust the devices that are on the wall and they're not constantly beeping and silencing and maybe even cutting off electricity to those those devices. So when you look at the data set that we that we used, um, the alarm AI module that we have within the with the edge platform allows you to really be able to leverage kind of the alarm duration and some other uh, critical factors within our algorithm to to allow you to kind of reduce the overall volume that may be hitting your uh, hitting your team. So those those notifications that are coming out and saying, hey, you've got a PLD alarm, you've got uh, you know, you've got a sensor alarm, you've got a probe out alarm. You know, so if, as you see here, we went from from close to 14 million alarms and by leveraging that algorithm on a kind of a 10 minute scale, any alarms that have occurred and cleared within that time frame, which would be kind of testing uh, air and alarms that occurred for probe out or sensor out alarms. It's reducing that overall volume by, you know, uh, by right at 80, 85 percent of the total alarms that are that were occurring in the system. So the, what that's doing is taking weight off of your staff from from touching those alarms, having to deal with them. Now, those alarm conditions are still occurring. They're still beeping at the store level. So we're going to talk about that in, in just a bit. But what we're what we're doing through Alarm AI is actually reducing that volume. So your teams are actually dealing with the, the true priority issues the true potential leaks that may be happening, you can triage those, really allow your, your teams to drill into that. And the more you leverage Alarm AI, you can see, you know, we went out to alarms that, that were you know, uh, occurring and clearing within 60 minutes of, of the initial time that, that they triggered. And over 93% of those alarms were, were able to be cleared through Alarm AI. So leveraging technology in a platform to allow you to kind of minimize those conditions is, is one mechanism that allows you to really help your teams kind of focus on the true problems that may be happening at your location and kind of reducing that overall noise so your team's not maybe false di you know, dispatching items that really don't need to be dispatched out. The, the other aspect is, you know, how do you kind of leverage the data that you're getting, right? Because uh, we mentioned before, those alarm conditions are really still occurring at your locations. So how do you kind of, you know, work on reducing that overall issue rate at your site level. So it's really leveraging those data points, right? With our platform, we're capturing all of those, all of those conditions, date, time, the types of alarms that are occurring, whether it's a fuel maintenance or environmental related alarm. And we're able to kind of help you view that information in a way that you can build processes to reduce those, those overall volumes. And that's something we'll talk about in the, in the subsequent slides, but you know, the goal would be is one, reducing that issue rate on your teams. And then secondarily, how do you actually go ahead and, and work on kind of reducing those issues that are happening at your store level? So you're having fewer alarms that are that are occurring at the site level. You can make sure that you're optimizing your capital budgets, your operational budgets in a way that's actually helping you further reducing those those alarms. So we want to try to reduce that overall trend that you're seeing with a volume of alarms so that you're not seeing two to three million or more a year, uh, depending on your, your company size, but that you're seeing those alarm conditions and those, those exceptions come down and then you're having fewer issues that your teams are having to respond to and, and follow up on. And, and John, I don't know if you have anything additional you wanted to I was just going to ask, Brent, you know, from your perspective, you've been at this, um, you know, in terms of environmental compliance within the world of USTs for a long time. Um, what have you seen uh, in terms, you know, many years ago, I imagine there wasn't much technology um, for, for people to throw at this problem. Did they just have to hire bodies? Did they 
have to, you know, do they ignore it? Um, what sort of happened and what are you starting to see all of that shift to in, in modern times? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. I think, you know, overall, you know, certainly the, the, in the past, you know, past 10 years or so, it's just people are throwing bodies at it. They're trying to manage it uh, with, with the teams that they have. They, they may be only getting to a percentage of these types of alarms, right? They're, they're not hitting all of the true issues and there's probably conditions that are kind of uh, slipping through the cracks. But, but what you're seeing out in the industry as a whole and not just on the environmental side of things or the fuel side of things is that companies are, are really looking at ways to kind of leverage data uh, across their organizations to make better business decisions. So I think, you know, really being able to kind of dive in, understand what's, what's actually occurring across their, their sites, the, the types of conditions and ways to kind of prevent that. That's further reducing cost and effort. And then, you know, allows them to actually do a lot more with the, the teams that they have rather than just really kind of, you know, sifting through the issues that are occurring and the noise that's actually happening across these. So great question. Yeah, I think that kind of segues into into our next bit here, which is around configuration management. And as we talked about before, if your settings are incorrect, you're going to be notified about things perhaps too frequently, perhaps not often enough. It's one of those kind of Goldilocks things. You want it to be just right. So, Brent, tell us a little bit about configuration management within um, the Titan Edge platform. So the config management, you know, the, like we mentioned kind of early on, is that a lot of a lot of companies kind of set it and forget it. They come in. They, they establish their priority and non-priority alarm conditions. They program you know, the systems uh, in, as, as best they can. Um, and then over time, either their service base or the, you know, when they're installing new sites, those, those configurations may change. And so config management gives you a tool that allows you to actually store all of the ATG configurations. So we're pulling into those gauges at a, at a set frequency and we're saving all the configuration files in the config management module. And so as, as items change, configuration changes at the site level or maybe even changes on the gauge level, you're able to actually see those, those changes occur. And it's gonna call out when something is drifted from your, your standard protocol that you might have on your, on your programming. A great example might be, let's say on the fuel side, you've set your low level limit on your tank to maybe 400 or 500 gallons, what you know, maybe 10% of the, of the low level limit of your, of your tanks. So, and you want to make sure that that's maintained across all your all your tank systems. Config management will monitor that on your on your tanks, and it will alert you if something changes. That somebody's gone out and they program that ATG incorrectly, uh, uh, different from your your yeah, configuration, um, and then you have the ability remotely to actually change that on the site level or to accept that in the database. So now you have you know you you're maintaining that level of standardization across your across your organization. So it, it also goes a little bit broader than that when you really look at, you know, running a report with all of the backend configuration, you know, if the site gets hit by lightning, all of that data is actually stored within the platform and you can actually push that out so that you don't have a technician out there manually programming that in through their laptop or on the, on the console themselves. So then you, you inherently are gonna introduce errors into the, into the programming. So, you know, again, we, go, we step back, it's really, getting it to good quality data and maintaining that data so that you can really get actionable analytics as you move forward with your with your program and work to kind of reduce that overall volume of alarms and, and minimize that noise. We're going to shift gears now and go into q and I think um, there have been a couple of questions that have come through um, throughout the session. We've talked here today about um, Titan's Alarm AI module, which allows you to really reduce the noise when it comes to alarm management. Uh, and then also the configuration management module. Um, and I believe there may have been a couple of questions that came in there, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna welcome our colleague, uh, Jeff Sexton, as well as um, Connor Weigand to the screen here, uh, if they want to hop on and uh, Connor will walk us through uh, the questions that have emerged uh, throughout the session. All right, so we did get some questions from the audience. Jeff, do you wanna introduce yourself really quickly? Sure. Uh, with Jeff Sexton, uh, much like Brent, I've had 25 years of experience running environmental compliance for a transportation trucking company. Awesome. And I'm a Titan Cloud's handy dandy field marketing manager. So I'm going to be moderating the Q&A section here for us. So first question from the audience uh, we got was, how do you handle alarms during testing and or maintenance? 
Yeah. Brian, do you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, so the, so the Alarm AI functionality actually will allow you to, to manage that where it, it actually is eliminating those alarm conditions. So it's not tying up or, at, you know, we mentioned in, in other items on activity side, but the, the Alarm AI, right, those, those alarm conditions are going to, uh, you're going to begin and, and clear within a fairly specific amount of time within, you know, 20, 20 minutes, maybe an hour as they cycle through those, those items. But it's also a cause and effect. So John kind of mentioned that uh, previously. So if you see them all in, in sequence of them occurring, Alarm AI will filter that out so your team's not having to, to manage those items. And Jeff, I don't know if you, you know, your experience, if you have any other, any other items to share on that? Uh, yeah, and actually I was going to um, chime in and kind of do a um, question back to you, Brent, on this. Uh, you know, with both, both of us being in the industry for so many years, when a maintenance tech or uh, you know, testing vendor changes out sensors or you know, changes equipment on site, how often have you seen that they actually go back into the configuration management and uh, on the site on the ATG and actually change um, any of the configurations? Whether it's needed to or not needed to, even you know, they, they forget to do it or they do it, but they do it wrong. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the, the company and the SLAs they have, they have set for those, those, um, those companies. Um, companies that are really managing that to a to a very precise level, you know, they're you know they're requiring those those maintenance technicians and those companies to go back in and change them. Um, it's probably a lower percentage of those that that you actually see, but um, but uh, you know that that is a huge segment, right? In in areas where there is uh, certified programs for technicians that touch the ATGs, usually have a lot better data quality from those gauges. But in other areas. Uh, it's a lot less frequent that they're actually updating it the way it should. But great question. Great. All right, we'll move along. Um, and if anyone has any other questions that come up throughout this Q&A section, please feel free to drop them over in that chat. So we had another come in. Um, Severe weather seems to be the deciding factor for an uptick in some alarms recently in many parts of the world. Does AI take into account flood watches? Yeah, the the on the AI side, you know, if you if you look at the it's it's taken into account the duration of those alarm conditions, right? So water inside of the tank, you know, we and we have some other technology for water trend reporting that, how, that helps you kind of catch phase separation or kept, catch water intrusion before it becomes phase separation. Um, but, you know, typically if you're, if you have severe weather and that severe weather is causing water ingress uh, into the, into the tanks and, or water in, ingress into your sumps, um, those alarm conditions are going to occur and they're going to, um, they're going to stay intact for a much longer period of time until you mobilize technicians out to actually resolve that. So the way of the way our alarm AI would work is you would still be notified of those issues. Um, you know, if it's, a, if it's alarming and clearing, or if it's tied to other specific events um, that are not priority events, um, then it will notify you of those or it will suppress those. But um, you, you will see um, notifications for those severe weather events uh, if, as long as that alarm condition stays active for a specific period of time. All right, we have a few more. Um, does Alarm AI automatically run remote line tests as part of the automated remote troubleshooting process? Jeff, you want to take that one or happy to? Oh, yeah. go ahead, Brent. Uh, it doesn't today. That's that's something that we're working on the development side. We can surface the the alarm conditions. Uh, we'll surface the you know if it's let's let's say it's a PLD alarm that's associated with low fuel alarm. We'll suppress those those items. We're going to surface those issues for you. You can go into the terminal emulator or the console connect or the web connect, and you'll be able to run that uh, manually through that through that process. Uh, but today, it's not an automated process necessarily through the system. But that is something that we're hoping to to have uh, implemented in the in the future. Okay. Good question. All right, we got another one here. What are the advantages and new benefits provided by Titan Cloud when upgrading from the TLS three hundred and fifty to the TLS four hundred and fifty? 
So, oh, Brent, I'll take this one. Uh, you know, really, you know, for us, it doesn't matter if you have a 350 or a 450, whatever the benefit you're getting from that um, monitor on site, you're going to get it through us. So, obviously, you know, there's a little bit more um, features that are available through a 450, um, and you'll get those through our web portal and connectivity, um, whether it's BIR, um, if you have it um, connected, but you know, same thing on the 350, you're going to get the full functionality from a 350 to a 450. So we don't have any limitations between either of them. It's just for, you know, your company, your preference, what type of gauge you want. Um, you'll get the same functionality, um, whatever they give you on site. And Brent, I don't know if you got any yeah, other things. Yeah, I would. And then Jeff, you, you were, you were alluding to it, but. 450s are going to have a little bit more technology inside of it. You know, they're they're going to come with standard with the the ability to connect the to the electronic dispenser dispenser interface modules and your fourth port controllers. So, as an organization, if you wanted to utilize flow rate monitoring or or our high frequency polling to get more you know, more access to your data, you're going to have more technology on the 450 than you necessarily would on the 350. Now, you can certainly purchase that and install it, but it's not a it's not necessarily a standard feature of the of the uh, 350s. Perfect. Uh, so we got a few more minutes left, so I'm going to keep going. We got quite a few. Um, what happens if a tech changes a tank monitor settings on site? Do I get notified? Yeah, we we talked about the config management aspect of it. So. If you are utilizing config management from from uh, the Edge platform today, if there was a change on that ATG at the site level, config management would notify you um, and tell you that there that something has been changed on the ATG and it's different from what the what the Edge platform's data has. So you would have the ability um, to see that that change, what what actually changed when it changed. You wouldn't necessarily see the you know the technician who actually changed it. But you'll know time, you know, date, time, some general information about what was changed for it. So you'd have the ability to be able to, to update that. With, without config management, you would have to actually dial into the gauge, save that back in some way, and, and then cross-reference it in order to be able to see that change. But great question. So this person said, as you mentioned, gross line fails can be caused by a few issues. Can your system differentiate in what is causing a gross line fail? That's a great question. Since I was the one that brought it up, I can uh, I can take a crack at answering that one. And, and the answer is yes. Um, in in terms of uh, essentially, we've generated a uh, sort of rules engine, if you will, where what's going to happen is the alarm is going to occur, and then the software is going to go to work sort of investigating what's going on and by gathering other information from the tank monitor. So as soon as a PLLD alarm goes off, um, it's going to say, okay, well, in order to make sure that this wasn't a low product alarm, let's see how much inventory is in this particular tank. Let's see if a low product alarm went off. Let's see if a low product alarm settings were configured where we would expect them to be in order to trigger a low product alarm. Because if those conditions are met, then in all likelihood, it's a, it's a gross line failure associated with low product as opposed to a gross line fail that may be associated with an environmental issue. Similarly, if that gross line fail um, you know, goes off, the system will automatically be looking and say, okay, based on this, we know that now we need to understand what the pressure readings were for that line test, and we'll, it will control the gauge automatically for those readings, determine, you know, look at those and say, hey, here's what they are, it's kind of trending down, you know, they, they were lower than expected. You know, This in all likelihood looks like it's gonna be associated with a, a pressure issue as opposed to necessarily an environmental issue. And then as Brent pointed out before, we have our ability to dial in remotely to the game where you could then run a line test in order to, you know, um, try to remote before you actually set something on the site. So you. However, it's going to give you a lot more context around what the root cause is by probing that tank monitor for some additional information as opposed to just saying the RLD alarm went off at this time at this location, you're on your own to figure it out. So there's a little bit of intelligence kind of going on behind the scene, which has all been developed based on industry best practices um, that the that the folks like Jeff and Brent who have been at this for years 
um, have helped us uh, standardize and turn into um, rules that now live within the system as opposed to depending on the individual responding to that um, um, on a, um, a one-off basis as it occurs. All right. Um, well, I think we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, my service provider responds to alarms for us. Can I give my service provider access? Absolutely. Yeah. It, uh, Titan is, uh, is you're not limited by the number of individuals you can provide access to the platform. Um, you can establish testing vendor roles, maintenance vendor roles. You can, you can, dictate or define what level of access that individual would have. So, for example, if you wanted to provide access for a for a maintenance technician to give them visibility into the terminal emulator, we could set up a role for you or we could train you on how to set that role up uh, to allow them to have that level of visibility where they can troubleshoot that gauge remotely uh, rather than maybe having to dispatch out uh, for that alarm condition. Maybe they are able to resolve it without uh, mobilizing their trucks, but um, you can set up all of those different types of access and role levels from an administrative standpoint. We can certainly work with you on that. Also, it looks like Scott had a question about where he would get one of these um, Titan Cloud shirts. Book your personalized assessment and, uh, and I'm sure we can help you. <laughs> exactly, perfect. Well, I think um, that that's it as far as our time is uh, uh, concerned. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Jeff, for joining the Q&A. Brent, um, excellent perspective as always. And thank you, Connor, for quarterbacking all of this. Really appreciate it. And thank you for all of you who dialed in today to join us. Um, again, um, please, uh, be. Uh, we encourage you to sign up for a personalized assessment to evaluate how some of these technology tools can help you manage your alarms and manage your configurations. Um, with confidence um, with all your facilities that are out there. Um, so may want to avoid any um, issues that may come up and our technology is designed to help you with that. Um, also, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a three-part webinar series. This was session one. We have two more coming up. The next one is going to be all about maximizing the value of walkthrough inspections on August 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And then the final webinar in the series is going to be about uh, our work order management module and how you can take um, all the alerts and notifications and intelligence that um, you're getting from the Titan software system and then you know get it out into the field uh, as necessary when people need to, to go and be the boots on the ground to help your sites get back into compliance or whatever it may be. And that one is at, uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern on August 22nd. So we're looking forward to seeing you all then. Thank you again for joining. And uh, without any further ado, um, we will wrap up here. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.